So, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, uh, the organizer. It's really a great school and I'm very happy to be uh, back in China. So, I want to talk in these two hours uh, on... Everything was very well organized until I came. That's good. Um, so, I want to talk about that introduction in these uh, two hours. And there's only one thing I, I'm asking of you is to Please ask questions during my talk, and I know that you've already done that in the previous um, previous talk. I also want to give some uh, some advice, which is um, this talk is about algorithms, and if you really want to understand an algorithm, I think it's a very good idea to um, to implement the algorithm. And now you're very lucky because there's a lot of uh, computer packages that allows you to implement very simply um, most of the algorithms. Okay, so in this school yesterday, you saw a lot of application, a lot of a great application of lattices into uh, cryptography. And as you know, there's also a lot of application in computer science and in statistical physics. And today, what I want to do is put a, a bigger, a bigger picture within mathematics. So there's actually a lot of deep questions in mathematics related to lattices coming from algebraic number theory coming from algebraic geometry and um, sphere patterns, for instance. And there's a lot of um, great mathematicians who study lattices, uh, among others, uh, a couple of few uh, field medalists. And very recently, for instance, Venkatesh got the field medal uh, last year, and he has a paper on the LLL algorithm, believe it or not. So even if you're a field medalist, maybe you, know, you can be uh, interested in lattices. What I want to do uh, this morning is, I want to tell you some background, and then I will uh, revisit the lattice problems that Chris introduced uh, yesterday. And this will bring me to natural uh, questions such as worst case risk reduction, and the connection to lattice reduction. I will uh, say something about the LL algorithm, say something about enumeration, and blockwise algorithms, and at the end I will uh, tell you about um, what are the um, difficulties when you want to do security estimates for, for lattice-based cryptography. Okay, so far uh, so good. So let's start with some notation on lattices. And as I said, I'm interested in uh, the mathematical aspects this morning. If you want to know more about it, there's a lot of, uh, lot of textbook. I would, however, make uh, two recommendations. One is a very nice all lecture notes by Siegel, which have been published by, um, by Springer uh, a couple of years ago. I think this is a course, a very old course of Siegel, but it's very simple, very elementary. Another thing, if you like more advanced uh, topics related to lattices, I would really highly recommend a lecture note by this field medal Venkatesh, who was formerly at, at Stanford. So he has some lecture notes on geometry of numbers. You can, you can download it. All right, so yesterday when you saw lattices, you actually restricted to integer lattices. So if you, if you put the, uh, a more general form of lattices, these are called Euclidean lattices. So what you do is you take the, uh, the n-dimensional space and you view it as Euclidean space. So you have, a, you have an inner product and then you have a Euclidean norm. So when you take this Euclidean space, you're going to call a lattice any subgroup of this n-dimensional space that is discrete for the topology. So what does it mean? It means that for every point in the lattice, there is some radius such that the intersection of the lattice with the ball is restricted to that point. So this picture is actually more to see. So for every point in the lattice, I can find some ball, a red ball, such that the only point, or the only lattice point inside, is that, is that point. Okay. So of course if I take a, a, a bigger ball, I can find all the lattice points. But I can always, if I restrict the radius, I, I can always isolate the point. So that's it. And in that case, when I have this definition, so I'll call lattice, 
And I will call the rank or the dimension of the lattice as the dimension of the linear span, the subspace span by the lattice. So with that definition, uh, the most the simplest example of a lattice would be Zn. So indeed, I mean, Zn is a subgroup of R to the n, and Y is it discrete? Which value of R can I take to isolate every point of Zn? Zn. So if I take R equal uh, Yeah, any number less than one will work. Okay, okay, so that's good. So that is one person that, that can follow, including myself. So that, that's good. Um, okay. So um, yesterday you, we talked about integer lattices. So integer lattices are just a special case of these lattices. So essentially, we're going to take any subgroup of this integer lattice. But with the one constraint, I want the quotient to be a finite group. Okay? So if I take any subgroup of Zn, quotient might be infinite. But if I, if I take an integer lattice such that the rank is n, then necessarily the quotient is going to be finite. Okay? So these are the lattices that you deal with in cryptography. In cryptography, we always work with an integer lattice such that the quotient is finite. Okay. So this is actually the group that replaces the RSA group or the elliptic curve group. Okay. So this is something that is often confusing. The lattice itself, L, is infinite. And we don't like infinite sets. But we are actually not working in the lattice directly. What we're doing is we're working this, with this finite abelian group. So the whole trick of lattice cryptography is we work below the lattice. So that's why, actually, in many uh, description of lattice cryptography, we, we don't see the lattice. We work modulo the lattice. Okay? So one thing I will need, I want, so it's very hard in two hours to talk about lattice reduction, so I, want, I just need one notation, one big notation. For any uh, real vectors, I'm going to call L of B1, Pn, uh, their the Z span, which means I'm taking all the linear combinations of these vectors with integer coefficients. Okay, so actually, that's a good time to write this notation. Okay. So then we have a, an interesting characterization of lattices. So if I say that L is a discrete subgroup of R to the M, it's exactly the same as saying there are some linear independent vectors such that the lattice is exactly the set of all the linear combinations, integer linear combination of these vectors. So those vectors, we call them a basis. Okay, so you see a picture here. I could take these blue vectors, or I could take these red vectors, or I could take these green vectors. All the linear combination of these green vectors is the same as the combination of these red vectors, and so on. So bases are not unique. Okay, so there are many ways to represent a lattice. So we also need some, um, so we can define some invariants of a lattice. So once we take a basis, some things do not depend on the choice of the basis. Okay? Whether it's a blue basis or the red basis or the green basis, some things never change. For instance, the number of elements 
of the basis doesn't change. So that's the rank. If you see this picture, you can see that these parallelogram are quite different. However, the area defined by this parallelogram is the same. So if I take this red area, it's actually the same as this green area and this blue area. So that's the volume of the lattice. So here's the volume of the parallel pipette. And if you want to compute it, it's very easy. You take all the dot products between these vectors, and that defines um, a positive definite matrix. And you take the determinant of that matrix, and you take the square root. That's, that's the volume. So in mathematics, it's actually called a co-volume because it also corresponds to the measure of the quotient, the quotient of the subspace spanned by the lattice divided by the lattice itself. So this you can view it as a torus. So this torus is compact, and you take the measure of this torus. And the final environment that we will need in this talk is the first minimum. So if you take, if you take a, any ball and you intersect it with the lattice, you see that there are only finitely many points inside the ball. So you can define uh, a shortest vector. A shortest vector would be any vector such that the Euclidean norm is minimal, provided that you remove zero out of the equation. So we're taking any lattice vector and we take the Euclidean norm, the minimal Euclidean norm. So you can also say, I take all the integer vectors and I multiply by the basis. Okay. And that gives me the same, the same thing. So that's lambda 1. So one thing which is, um, so once we've done that, what, what are the ideas that we will need to do something uh, non-trivial? So one key idea in lattices, and also in lattice-based photography, is duality. And often when you see lattice-based photography, you work with matrices, vectors. That really helps to understand how you implement the thing. But sometimes when you do that, you forget what you're doing, mathematically speaking. So duality is really a key idea. So what does it mean? When you take a lattice, you can consider all the points in the linear span such that the dot product with any lattice vector is an integer. So if you do that, you realize that this thing is a subgroup of R to the N. And it's not difficult to show that it's actually discrete. So therefore, it's a discrete subgroup of R to the N, so it's a lattice. We call it the dual lattice. So that means that for every point in the dual lattice, it defines a homomorphism from the lattice to Z. So there are, there are some relationships between the, the primal lattice, L, and the dual lattice. For instance, the rank are the same, and the volumes or inverse of each other. Okay. So there's a very um, classical area in mathematics that tries to connect invariants of the primal lattice with the dual lattice, such as lambda 1. How can I connect lambda 1 of these two lattices? Okay, so that's enough for my notation. Now I, want, I can finally explain what is lattice reduction. So we started with Euclidean space, and if you study bilinear algebra, you know that what is really important is the existence of orthogonal bases. If you do that, you use it all the time when you do uh, bilinear algebra. Unfortunately, in the lattice, there may not be an orthogonal basis. Actually, in general, there is no orthogonal basis in the lattice. So lattice reduction is a way to prevent this problem. We have no orthogonal basis in general, but we always have what we call reduced basis. So this is like a proxy for an orthogonal basis. 
it means it's a basis such that the vectors are very short and almost orthogonal. So intuitively, if you see this picture, the green vectors are not so nice, but obviously these red vectors look nice. They are short and they're almost orthogonal. So concretely, when you have a matrix, this would be non-reduced and this would be reduced. So here would mean that the dot product between these two row vectors would be fairly small. Okay. So it's not zero, but it's fairly small. So why were people interested in this lattice reduction business? So historically, people use lattice reduction, the existence of nice bases, to establish inequalities between lattice environments. And what is interesting is that in mathematics, these kind of disappear. People realize that you can get much better inequalities if you forget about lattice reduction. So mathematicians have introduced uh, more sophisticated tools to get rid of this uh, lattice reduction. However, when we deal with algorithms, lattice reduction is still very useful. Okay. We're kind of stuck with lattice reduction. Sure. I will see that later. So. Please don't ruin my talk now. Okay. okay, so we saw the we have our necessary notation, so now we can talk about mathematical questions. So here is a very natural question. I give you a lattice. And I'll give you a subset, a subset of the space. Can you tell if the intersection is non-empty? A more complicated question would be uh, how many points does this intersection have? So if I take a if I take a subspace, a subset, and a lattice, what can I say about the intersection? So Minkowski found uh, a hundred, uh, one century ago a very uh, interesting uh, criterion. He said that if the sub subset is measurable, if it's convex, if it's symmetric, which means that if x is in the point, minus x is also in the set, and if it's big enough, that means if its measure is bigger than the volume of the lattice by some exponential factor, then C must contain at least one non-zero point. So by the way, why is this picture misleading? It's not symmetric, yes. Another problem would be... It's non-convex, okay? So yeah, everybody is waking up, me yeah, including myself, that's good. So you, you may wonder, what can we say about lattices in the worst case? How, how big can be a shortest vector? So that's what Hermit did a bit, uh, a bit before Minkowski. So what he showed is that when you take any lattice, if you look at lambda 1, the, norm of a, of a, the minimum norm of a non-zero vector, if you divide it by the diff root of the volume, then this is always a bound. No matter how bad is the lattice, this is always a bound. So that's Herbert constants, and for historical reason, we take the square root. Okay. So gamma d is Herbert constant in dimension d. Okay. So now I can give you one example of these uh, inequalities. So Hermit initially, he actually used that introduction. He showed the existence of nice bases to show that his constant was exponential. Okay? And then I told you that over the years, mathematicians removed this lattice reduction and they got much better inequalities. So for instance, if you apply Minkowski theorem, you immediately get a linear inequality on Hermit's constant. 
Okay, so instead of having this exponential bound, you have a linear bound. And because of this linear bound, you deduce that any lattice must contain a very short vector, less, whose Euclidean norm is less than square root of the dimension times the diff root of the volume. So it looks like this is really useless. You get much better bounds. So yes, if we're only interested in existence, this is much better. But now if you think about algorithms, how can I find such a vector? This is going to be very expensive. Whereas finding this exponential bound would be much cheaper. So algorithmically, we are still, um, it still makes sense to deal with lattice reduction. So you may wonder how natural are these bounds. These bounds are very, very natural. So to see this, let's bring some heuristic due to Gauss. So he noticed that this, this volume that we've defined actually measures the density of lattice point. So for instance, if you take, if you take the lattice as Zn, you would see this. You see that approximately, if my set is nice, I could imagine that the number of integer points inside the set is approximately the volume of the set. So that's for the Zn lattice, and more generally for any lattice, you would expect that the, the intersection with this set has approximately volume of the set divided by the volume of the lattice points. But of course this is just a heuristic. So sometimes it's right, sometimes it's correct, Sometimes it's completely wrong. But in general, this would hold. Okay. So now if you believe in this heuristic, if you believe me, what can you do? You could take the simplest set, take a ball, and you could count from which radius is this ratio very large or very small. Okay. So it's a standard calculation to compute the volume of a ball depending on its radius. And if you do that, you realize that for a big enough constant, the ratio of the volume of the ball of this radius divided by the volume of the lattice must be exponential. Okay. And in fact, this is a theorem. So before we said there's always a vector less than square root of d times the volume, the d for root of the volume. But if you increase the constant, then you have exponentially many vectors. Okay? On the other hand, if you decrease the constant here, by the same Gaussian heuristic you would expect there's no non-zero vectors. And actually that's true for random lattice. For random lattice, all non-zero vectors must be of norm bigger than this, for a certain constant. Okay? So we have a, a phase transition. If the constant is big enough, we have exponentially many vectors, and if not, we have no vectors. Provided that you take a random lattice. Otherwise, in the worst case, it's very easy to build a lattice for which you find a very short uh, vector. All right. So now we can uh, revisit what was uh, described and defined yesterday, so we can, we can define our lattice problems. So remember that when we, when we think about lattice algorithms, we must deal with integer lattices. So a basis will be represented by a matrix, an integer matrix, and we would see that the lattice is just uh, the span of these rows. Okay? So when you have a matrix, there are two, two interesting things. The size of the coefficients and the dimensions of the matrix. Okay? But in theory, for, from a complexity point of view, you don't like to have a two different parameters, so there's only one main parameter, that's the dimension. And you imagine that the, the size of the coefficients is polynomial in the dimension. Okay. So before defining precisely what all this lattice problem, you saw that picture yesterday. So for the last uh, 23 years, there's been a lot of uh, results on the complexity of lattice problems, both in the classical uh, uh, world and the quantum world. So here's what we know. We know that when the approximation factor is very small, say a constant, we know it's NP-hard under randomized reduction. 
However, if you relax your problem up to square of the dimension, it becomes non-NP-hard. Under some uh, well-known conjecture. And if you relax even more to an almost linear factor, you get this so-called worst-case Jovich reduction. And it was mentioned uh, yesterday by Chris, if you go even further, if you go to a polynomial factor, you do cryptography. But the margin is thin. For instance, uh, if you go to a sub-exponential approximation factor, you can solve it in sub-exponential sub time, like factoring. And if you go to an almost exponential factor, you get a polynomial time algorithm. Okay. So the big question is, can we survive around here? Is this still a hard problem? So before, when I, when I introduced the math question, I said that um, we're given a lattice, we're given a set, can we decide if the intersection is non-trivial? So you would do the same algorithmically. You would say, let's take a very simple set, a ball. If I take a ball and a lattice, can I tell can I decide if intersection is non-trivial? And if I know it's non-trivial, can I find a point? And you realize that if I take Zn, if you think about it, take Zn, take any ball, this is very easy to decide. Think, uh, think about it. How to decide if the intersection of Zn with a ball is non-trivial and find a point inside that intersection. But surprisingly, as soon as you change Zn into an arbitrary lattice, it's not trivial anymore. So this actually gives you two different settings. You imagine a setting where we know that the intersection has many points, and our problem is to find just one. There are really tons of solutions, but we only want to find one. So that's the case for the so-called uh, SIS problem of Chris yesterday. Also, he's, um, he's variant with a target where he called the ISIS, a very bad name now. Um, so that's one thing. Another setting is, imagine that this ball is very special. We know that the intersection is actually only has one non-trivial point. So that's the unique setting, what I call a unique setting, and then in that case there's only one solution, and we want to find it. So that's the case of this bounded distance decoding case. Okay, so imagine you're always in these two configurations. Either you have tons of solutions, and you need to find just one, or you only have one very special solution. Okay? Yeah? So in the random case, that is true. But of course, for complexity, we, are, we, all, we also care about the worst case. And then the Gaussian is will fail. For instance, take a ball and just move it. Take a very small radius ball and move it around the space. So you see the Gaussian risk doesn't matter where the, where the ball is centered, right? But obviously, if you switch, if you move this ball and you reach lattice point, it will have some non-trivial points. But you wouldn't see it from the Gaussian risk. So that brings you to the shortest vector problem. If you choose a very special ball, you could say, okay, I give you a lattice. Can you find a shortest non-zero vector? So say, find a non-zero vector whose norm is exactly the first minimum. So say, I give you a matrix. Can you find a linear combination of these row vectors that has minimal norm. So that is finding this vector. Okay. So as we said before, this is a very hard problem. It's an NP-hard problem with the randomized reduction. So therefore, we want to make it easier. So we want to relax this problem. How can you do that? So we want to find some almost shortest vector. And there's essentially two ways to measure this. One would be to say, the norm of that vector is not that far from the first minimum. 
up to some uh, approximation factor depending on the dimension. So that's the uh, approximate SVP problem. Or if you define it absolutely, saying that, thanks to Hermit constant, you could say, let's measure the norm divided by the fruit of the volume. Again, by some approximation factor. So fortunately, there are a relationship between these two problems. You can solve this for, some, for a certain function f. You can also solve this problem for a certain function g and reciprocal. Okay, so we, I'm going to ignore the difference, the subtle differences between these two problems. So let's think about approximate finding short vectors as one of these two things. One remark I want to say, though, is that if you have a solution to this problem, it's hard to check because you don't know lambda 1 in general. Whereas here, you can always compute the volume over the lattice. So this is easy to check. Now, it was mentioned already yesterday, there's a, there's a related problem called the closest vector problem, where this time, besides a lattice, you're also given a target vector in the space. And your goal now is to find a vector in the lattice, minimizing the distance to the target. So if I take the target here at t, I want to find this v point. I want to find a lattice point minimizing the distance to t. Okay. And then you heard about bounded distance decoding, which is the analog of the coding problem, where you imagine that t is not any target. You chose t such that t is very close to the lattice. So typically, you would start with v, add some small noise, and that's your target. Okay, so it's not a random point in the space. You would choose it with a noise. Okay. So that's very good. We have this nice problem, the shortest vector problem and closest vector problem. But what is the first issue when somebody defines you a computational problem. So if you want to uh, get an intuition about how hard it is, the first thing you would like to do to play with it is to generate instances. Right? And already there's a problem. So why is there a problem? For instance, if I define you integer factoring, it would be easy for you to imagine how to select a random number. That's not so hard to think. But here there are many parameters. So you could ask yourself, okay, I want to study the shortest vector problem. How am I going to generate the lattice? Which distribution of integer lattices should be uh, interesting? If I move to CDP and bounded distance decoding, I also have to generate a lattice. And I have another problem. How do I generate the target? How do I decide how to choose the noise and how to choose a secret lattice vector? And if you think about it, this is really a non-trivial problem. It's not clear at all that there is a natural way to specify a distribution for the lattice. And actually, that was a problem in the early days of lattice-based cryptography. So in the, in the 90s, people struggled with that. How to choose a lattice? So of course, you can make your own distribution. But how do you know that this distribution is representative of, uh, of all integer lattices? Maybe the way you select your lattice make the problem easy. Okay. So to get some intuition, Let's ask the help of mathematicians. So this has been studied by a mathematician right after World War II. So Siegel showed that there's actually, a, surprisingly, a natural notion of random lattices. And I'm, going to tell, I'm not going to tell you what it is, because it's related to a sophisticated tool like the Haar measure. So this would be one of these sophisticated tools. But the only thing I want you to know is that actually, this is very natural if you're uh, comfortable with abstract uh, mathematics. But what is interesting is that many properties of these random lattices are known. For instance, for random lattice, you know how uh, lambda 1 looks like. So for instance, there's an old result by Rogers 
a sphere packing expert, who showed that if you take the ball of radius lambda 1, and if you take the volume of the ball of radius lambda 1, if you take a random lattice, it has a limit distribution. It turns out to be the exponential distribution. So that tells you a lot of information of how does lambda 1 look like, how the fluctuation of lambda 1 for random lattice. Okay, that's very good, but that's a real lattices. That doesn't answer my question, how to select a random integer lattice in a, in a good way. So how could I define a random integer lattice? So notice that if you take an integer lattice, a full rank integer lattice, as I mentioned very early, the quotient between Zm and the lattice is a finite Abelian group. And if you decompose, so we know that any finite Abelian group is a product of cyclic groups. So if you call the rank of this group the number, uh, the minimum number of groups in this decomposition, you see that this rank must be less than n. Okay, so it's not any finite Abelian group; it must have rank less than n. So this quotient gives you a way to classify all four rank integer lattices. So indeed, take now a finite building group G and define the following set. I define the set of lattices, integer lattices such that the quotient is isomorphic to my group. So I take any finite building group and asking what is this set? So the set of lattices such that the quotient is isomorphic to G. So one thing you can notice already is that this set is actually finite. There's only finitely many lattices whose, uh, whose quotient is exactly G. So because it's finite, they are therefore a very natural distribution. Let's take the uniform distribution over each, each set. And this is actually representative of all lattices because you can see that because of this, this is actually a partition of the set of all four rank lattices. So any, any lattices must fall in one of these sets. So if I, if I make G range over all finite abelian groups, I get a partition of the foreign lattices. Okay. And now there's a very uh, powerful theorem coming from ergodic theory that tells you the following. If I pick a lattice uniformly at random in this finite set, but for which group? For any sequence of group whose order grows to infinity. So the structure of the group doesn't matter. Take any finite abelian group whose order grows to infinity. Then ergodic theory tells you that the distribution of that integer lattice converges in some sense to the hard distribution, to this natural notion of random lattices. So there are some. Uh, this theorem was known for special case of GN. But now we have a very general statement. For any sequence of groups, it works. Okay. So now we have a good analog of random real lattices. We're just going to take the uniform distribution over this finite set for a big enough group. Okay. I choose a big enough group. I know from this that this will be a good proxy for random lattices. Okay. So this is a mathematical statement. A natural question would be to, to study the harness of finding a short vector in this lattice Ln. Okay. And that's exactly the SIS problem. 
So yesterday, Chris defined the SIS for us. He took actually a very special finite ability group. He took ZQ to the power n. Okay. So now forget that it's ZQ to the power n. Take any finite ability group and view it as a Z module. So you're going to say, so what, what, what am I saying here? I'm saying that if I take a small g in this group, 2 times g just means g plus g. 3 times g is g plus g plus g. So that's just a notation. Any finite group can, can be viewed as a Z module. So now I take this set is finite. Let's take n group elements uniformly at random from this group. And now the question is the following. Can you find short integers, small integers, x1, x2, xm, such that the sum of the xi, gi from that notation is equal to zero in the group? So we're trying to find short integers that match to zero. That's it. So yesterday it was you, you, were, you were taking a matrix. So that's just a way to implement this. But forget about matrices. Just take any group and just think about linear, uh, linear relationship between these group elements. Okay. Now, obviously, you can view this as a lattice problem because the set of xi's, so the sum of the xi gi is equal to zero, is obviously a subgroup of z to the n. And therefore it's an end. But actually, it's exactly the same problem as before. When you do this, you're actually finding a short vector for the uniform distribution in my previous set. So this group theoretical problem is actually finding a short vector in the random lattice inside this set. Okay. So that's the connection between lattices and groups. So when you first see SIS, you can view this as a combinatorial problem. But because you have this norm condition, so you, you want these XIs to be short, so for instance you can specify this kind of bounds, then you, 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 you have a relationship with lattices. So yesterday, Chris took ZQ to the end. That's what I did in 96. You could consider a, a simpler scale, a simpler case. For instance, you could take a cyclic group. So you take the integers mod Q. That means that you're choosing N numbers mod Q. And then you're asking, can I find small integers such that the sum of the XI, GI is equal to zero mod Q? So just one equation. This is actually exactly the same as finding a short lattice vector for a random lattice such that the quotient is isomorphic to the integers mod Q. And as Chris mentioned yesterday, we have this uh, incredible theorem that said that that was proved by ITI 96. But in a special case where my G is ZQ to the N, so this Q implicitly depends on N, must grow to infinity. So if you can solve this SI's problem for this sequence of groups, then you can find short vectors in every n-dimensional lattice. So that's why it's called a worst case theoretical reduction. This SI's problem is an average case problem. It specifies completely the distribution of everything. Well, here it's a worst case problem. I want, given any lattice, I want to find a short vector inside. So if you remember these algorithmic theory results, it's natural to ask, what if I replace these groups by an arbitrary sequence of finite double groups? And remember in my algorithmic theory theorem, I just needed the order of this group to grow to infinity. So here, in order to generalize this, I need the growth of the order to be fast enough. I cannot take any sequence 
of finite long groups, I must make sure that the order grows sufficiently quickly. So that's a, that's a special lower bound. And in that case, I can generalize the results. So it's shown that you can preserve this worst case theoretical reduction if you take any sequence of finite long groups whose order grows sufficiently quickly. So this is the computational analog of this ergodic theory result. So I want to tell you how it works. It's actually very simple. Okay. So remember, you want to find a short vector in every n-dimensional lattice. So let's pick a lattice. And because it's the worst case, we cannot make any assumption on this lattice. But we want to find a short vector in that lattice L. And the trick is to consider to divide that lattice by some integer. So here, I'm going to divide all the lattice elements by Q. Okay? So what do I get? I get a new lattice. It's a normal lattice. It's a lattice that includes my initial lattice. Okay. And if you do that, you realize that the quotient, the quotient is exactly zq to the n. Okay. So in terms of the abstract algebra, you have a, an exact sequence from L to this q minus 1 times L onto zq to the n. So that means that if you don't like fancy abstract algebra, let's just say that my initial lattice is now viewed as the kernel of some morphism here. So why does it matter? Imagine that you, know, you pick vectors in that new lattice and you define group elements using this map. So GI is just the image of the I. Now you realize that if ever some of the XI GI was equal to zero, like in the SI's problem, then that means by definition that the sum of the XI VI belongs to the lattice. So it's a way to transform vector in the over lattice into that is vectors. So that means that if I wanted to find a short vector in L, I could do it if I can find a small x size and short vi. If the vi's are short and the xi are small, then this guy is a short vector. And that's exactly what I want to do. But now I have a problem. How do I make sure that I can find such short xi's. But that's exactly the xi's problem. Finding small integers such that the sum of the xi gi is equal to zero. There's just one catch. What is the catch? There is a constraint to call the xi's problem. But Chris is not allowed to answer. SIS is an average case problem, which means it specifies a distribution. So I'm not allowed to ask SIS to solve this for any GIs. I'm only allowed to do this when what? So if you remember SIS, the distribution was specified here. My group element has to be chosen with uniform distribution. So here, I would be allowed to do this if I'm sure that the GIs have uniform distribution. Okay. And that's when it gets tricky. So when I write this, there's nothing, nothing complicated here. So I need some technical statement. So the technical statement comes from harmonic analysis. So harmonic analysis tells you that if my 
vectors vi's chosen the right distribution, then I can ensure that the image with this map has uniform distribution. So how do I do that? I just need to find some distribution of the lattice point, such that when I sum all the masses, I get approximately a 1 over the order of the group. And therefore, that's how people are led to the discrete Gaussian distribution. So this is the most natural example to enforce this relationship. So that's the key step behind all this worst-case theory reduction that tells you that no matter which lattice you start with, you always get the uniform distribution. It's independent of the lattice. So here now we have this worst-case theory trace reduction in just one slide. You just sample short random vectors in bar L, but you, you didn't choose any random vector. You make sure that the image has uniform distribution over the finite group. And because it has uniform distribution, you're allowed to call the SIS oracle. The SIS oracle gives you short integers such that the sum of the xi gi is equal to zero, and that gives you a short lattice vector. You pick the vi short, the xi's are short because it's at the si's output, and you get the lattice vector, a short lattice vector. So that's the worst case you case reduction because you didn't make any assumption on L. And still, you had, uh, you had the right to call the array. So what does that introduction have to do with it? So when you take the, uh, the simplest case with ZQ to the N, we only use the fact that if B is a reduced basis of L, then dividing it by Q makes the vectors shorter. It's still a reduced basis. But if I want to generalize this, to an arbitrary finite abelian group, I need to do something more. So I do some kind of lattice reduction. I need to find a reduced basis of a bigger lattice such that the quotient is exactly G. So that's, that's a special uh, lattice reduction. Okay, so now uh, before the break, I need a second problem. So now I, I, I finally um, define the distribution of lattices for the short vector problem. How about the closest vector problem? So remember I, I defined duality and I, 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 I use a very special lattice. I pick a fine doubling group and I define the lattice with the linear the relationship between group elements. So remember this SIS lattice. Now what happens if I take a dual lattice? So remember in my, my definition of the dual lattice, if you play this game, you realize that this dual lattice is related to the notion of, of characters. So the dual group is formed by all the uh, characters of the group, which is our morphism from G to the torus. So there are many ways to define characters. Here I'm using additive notation, so I want morphism from G to the torus. So if you play this game, you realize that this dual lattice is just the evaluation of characters at my group elements. So every point in the dual lattice corresponds to some character, and if you evaluate the character at the GIs, you get exactly uh, the coordinates. Okay. So that brings you to LWE. So that's a different way of, of viewing uh, yesterday's LWE. So again, take any finite doubling group. Take the same thing as we were doing with, G with SIS. Let's pick n random group elements from this group. And now I take the dual group. The dual group is finite. So I can take a random character, uniformly at random, from the dual group. 
here's an actual problem. If I give you the group element, and if I give you noisy approximations of the evaluation of the character, can you recover the character? Okay. So what does it mean noisy approximation? You pick, you evaluate S as GI, and you add some noise. But now you have a problem. What kind of noise should you take? Let's take a Gaussian noise. So what does it mean? Remember the character evaluates inside the torus. Okay, so the question is, what is the natural distribution over the torus, the real numbers modulo the integers? So if you take a real number, the most natural distribution would be the, Ga um, the Gaussian distribution. So these are all the real numbers. Now, there's a natural way to transform it to a, a distribution over the torus. You just add, you just add the, the mass of each point. So you get a distribution over the, the torus. So if you add all the mass, all the, the, the density, the probability, then you get this distribution. So this is over 0, 1. So 0, 1 is a representation of R divided by Z. So if you increase, if you increase the standard deviation of the Gaussian uh, distribution, you realize that this distribution becomes more and more uniform. So here, uh, the, blue, the blue curve is for a, a small sigma. If I increase sigma, I get something looking more like a line. Right? So that would be one way to specify this Gaussian noise. Okay. Well, of course, you're not going to be in the red case. In the red case, it would be too difficult. It would be uniform, so it would, it would not be a... Uh, will be a too difficult problem. So we're going to choose a, a small sigma. So for instance, you can do this for the simplest case, where it's a cyclic group, so it, it amounts to select numbers mod q. And what does it mean to evaluate the character? It's the same as finding a secret number given these random element, random integers, and randomized approximation of the products. So, S times G1 mod Q, S times Gn mod Q. And if you see this problem, and if you've been to crypto 96, you realize that it's actually the so-called hidden number problem introduced by Bonnet and Katzen in 96, so almost 10 years before LWE. So this problem and LWE is actually the same problem with different groups. LWE is taking ZQ to the power N, and uh, Bode and Venki are taking uh, the fact group ZQ. Okay. And now you again have an amazing worst case theoretical case deduction. So, Regev showed in 2005 that you can solve LWE for the special case of ZQ to the N, like in ITI SIS reduction. Then you can find short vectors again in every n dimension that is. There's just one catch. You can only do it on a quantum computer. Of course, as Chris mentioned, there are ways to dequantumize this result. You lose a little bit something, but you can, you can remove this, this, quantum, uh, this quantum case. But it's nice to see that from I type to radio, the only thing that changes is this. And again, we can play the same game. We can ask, does the structure of this group matter? No. You can take any sequence of finite building groups, provided that the order goes sufficiently quickly. Okay. So that's uh, that's Elder. That's the worst case of structure. I think that's a good time to do the break now. <laughs>